We also had a verdict last night, about 5.30 it came in, not that there wasn't enough going on for the day, but in the case in Iowa, in Cedar Rapids, a case against Jerry Burns for the death of 18-year-old Michelle Martenko. This man found guilty of first-degree murder. Uh, the jury did not have the case all that long, and they came back with that decision. This is the case, of course, in which this young victim was found murdered in her parents' car, parked at the Westdale Mall on the uh, west side there of Cedar Rapids. A uh, crazy case because it was a cold case, 40 years cold in the deep freeze, and it was familial DNA that brought this case back to life. You know, these, uh, these generic uh, gene <laughs> genealogical sites, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, they are creating a whole new base of information for law enforcement, and it was in this case where they found some old DNA from a family member that led them ultimately to the defendant, uh, in this case, Jerry Burns, and the... the challenging part of this case was what else was there? Could this case survive? Could it be prosecuted? Could it be won only on this uh, familial DNA? Well, the answer we know now as of last night is yes. Jerry Burns found guilty, not sentenced yet. That is supposed to happen uh, in due course, but we're going to talk about that and more. Here's that verdict from last night. The members of the jury uh, through the foreman have signed verdict form number one. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jerry Lynn Burns, guilty of the charge of murder in the first degree, dated this 24th day of February 2020, uh, signed by the uh, foreman of the jury, Mr. Lynch. Again, there's the verdict from last night in the case against Jerry Burns in the murder of Michelle Martenko, sentencing to come. Uh, it is a uh, state that does not have the death penalty. It will be life without the possibility of parole. That is sort of the default position on that. I am very happy right now to have uh, on the network here some family members from Michelle Martenko's family. This is her older sister, Janelle, and her husband, John. The Stonebreakers joining me now uh, live here. I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me ask you this first of all. 40 years old, this case. Did you at some point just start to think, you know, Michelle's murder is never going to be solved? Yes, uh, we thought that for a number of years until approximately 2005 when uh, DNA uh, became more sophisticated in its collection and, and, and analysis. And uh, from that point on, we had a glimmer of hope, let's put it that way. So, Janelle, you're uh, her older sister. Uh, we know that Jerry Burns was 25, 26 at the time of this crime. Your, your sister was 18. You were truly the big sister. So this had to hit you so tremendously hard. Describe, if you can, what, what that was like in those early days. Well, we got the call about 6 o'clock in the morning from my mother. And she had waited. She was respectful of our trying to get some sleep. She told us... In, in words that you could almost not understand that my sister had been murdered. And of course, we took off from Davenport where we lived at that time. We had a four-year-old son, made arrangements for him and went to Cedar Rapids. And the first couple of weeks were truly surreal. It was something that you could not believe was happening as the details of the case were made known to us. My mother had to go and identify the body even before we got there. Uh, it was it was beyond awful to imagine that my sister had been stabbed to death while Christmas shopping was just unthinkable. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think people can imagine what that must have been like. And so now you're going through year after year, holiday after holiday. Of course, this had to happen at or around Christmas time, making it even more difficult. So you're going through these seasons and maybe the pain is lessening just from time. But then in 05, as John indicates, you, you hear about this new DNA to help you get to the defendant, but still, you know, that's almost 15 years ago. So what was that period like? Uh, let, me, let me start with you, Janelle. What was that like when you first learned of that new possible uh, um, wrinkle in the case? At that, at that time, we had just moved and we were building a house. We were in a rental property and we got the call from Larison, Detective Larison, that they were working on the case and that they had DNA from the scene and that they were pursuing that. Uh, of course, they, uh, the DNA um, testing and all was new. It would eventually progress over years to where we have now uh, a really wonderful 
and very specific profile to identify people. But it was hope for us. It was the beginning of our thinking again about the case in a real positive way that something could be done. Uh, up until that time, we really didn't know to what extent the police had been working on the case. And from that time on, they kept in touch with us and would update us on what was happening. And we, again, were very hopeful. We saw their dedication and how they were going over the files and working on details to understand them since by uh, that time, time uh, uh, detectives were even working on the case from those who had started. You know, it, to put this in perspective, that was 25 years after the murder and 15 years ago, and now you're, you're kind of fired back up again thinking we're going to get some resolution to this case, uh, and yet it still drags on for many, many years. When did you finally get the call saying we got the guy? We were on our way to uh, Maryland to greet our, our first uh, granddaughter uh, from our son, our number two son and his wife, and we got a call uh, at approximately Frederick, Maryland, uh, two hours out, saying that uh, they had three brothers uh, in Manchester, Iowa, and as I've said before, not Pocatello, Idaho, not Portland, Oregon, not Miami, but Manchester, Iowa, just an hour's drive away. So it seemed very promising that among those three brothers was the killer. I mean, this had to be just fascinating from, from, from many different perspectives. A, you're deep in this case, and you're sound, it sounds like we got something to get us to the, to the defendant in this case. But also, you had to be thinking, well, th this is weird science here. What else is there that connects Jerry Burns to this crime? And I want to ask you, Janelle, you were a little older than, than Michelle. You didn't know Jerry Burns or people who knew Jerry Burns. Was he just a mystery man to you as well? Completely. Uh, Manchester, Iowa, actually. We didn't know anybody from Manchester, Iowa. And, uh, I mean, we had to look it up on a map. Uh, it was so different from the way we had been thinking over the years that it was somebody that she knew, that it was one of her friends, one of her boyfriends, somebody who was an acquaintance who had a grudge against her. And when those those leads in, uh, were were finalized by DNA matching, uh, we realized that this was it. This is the totally unknown person who had been out there all of those years. Yeah, I'm sure the, these ex-boyfriends and others were probably top of mind when you first heard about Michelle's death, uh, and then those were discounted, as you say. So at a certain point, you agreed with authorities. This is the guy. We, we do have the right guy. Is that right, Janelle? Absolutely. Um, I don't think we understood exactly how the DNA matching would uh, would work. And we have uh, learned since a lot more about that. But we did understand that DNA could totally identify a person as a specific killer. You know, I, I see in both your eyes when we talk about that day when you you thought you might have the guy, a little kind of a glimmer. I even see it's a day of hope that it was that it was such an important day for you. Tell us what it was like sitting in that courtroom while this case played out in front of you. Well, um, for me, it was deja vu. And this is a very personal response because I'm a civil trial lawyer and I tried cases in that courtroom for 30 years. So, and I hadn't been back since. And so uh, walking into that courtroom, sitting on the other side of the bar in a case that involved my wife and I personally was uh, absolutely surreal. It was like a, a, a dime store novel. I couldn't believe it. And I don't think Janelle could either. I can't imagine, Janelle, what that was like. And as you get closer to deliberations and the verdict, how were you feeling? Well, the presentation of the trial had its ups and downs. Uh, in, you know, one moment we're, we're very encouraged and the next moment we're thinking, okay, some details have to be gone back over. It was amazing to be in the room, actually, with the person who's accused of killing my sister. Uh, that was an amazing thing for me and very emotional. And uh, I was very hopeful, though, because I, I did believe 
that the DNA was going to be dispositive. And as it turns out, it was. Do you guys feel um, you know, any sort of closure, any sort of relief as a result of this verdict? Well, we do. Uh, this, this chapter is over. We know who did it, and we know a little bit of why, and that it wasn't one of her friends who hated her or had a grudge. It was some impersonal person who had their own issues and and uh, killed my sister in this absolutely horrible way. So that part was closure. We still are left with the fact that we've lost my sister. We've I've lost all of those years that she didn't live. And she had such a bright future and she was looking forward to college and we we lost all of that. Yeah, it's, it's truly a tragic story, and I can imagine the emotions running wild between, yes, we might finally have the guy, and oh, great, now we have to relive all of the emotions and the drama that we went through 40 years ago. That, that had to be difficult. Uh, Janelle, what, what, about, what happen go, happens going forward? Uh, will you guys do victim impact statements? My husband has prepared one, and I think that would be very nice if at some point he can read that or have it read. Um, I think that would say quite a bit about the way we have felt about the case and how we feel now. One quick question to, before I let you go here. I know that uh, the likely sentence is life without the possibility of parole. That's the state of the law in Iowa. Are you okay with that? Very much so. Okay. Thank you both for being here. I appreciate it. Janelle, John Stonebreaker, Janelle, the older sister of the victim in this case, Michelle Martenko. Thank you, folks. A difficult time for you, but in some ways positive. We're going to take a quick break. Coming back, uh, more on this case, more on the Weinstein case, and we have a brand new case just starting up in Wisconsin. We will be back. This is Long Crime. <laughs>